Um, well, first, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to, to talk, um, to, to visit with the group. I really am most eager to learn more about um, the Linguistic Justice Society, and I'm hoping that we can kind of get through maybe just an orientation to the way that I approach uh, language and literacy studies. Um, I know we're working across uh, many fields represented in, in this call, uh, so I'm hoping that kind of just like a kind of broad strokes how, how I approach my own work and research uh, could help us get into conversations about um, how you all are approaching um, pursuit of linguistic justice across multiple fields of study. Uh, I know uh, Kagla uh, from Syracuse and from the philosophy department, um, but I'm interested to hear how others of you are situated. Uh, I did a bit of reading, uh, but it's hard to tell who will show up and who's, <laughs> who's represented in this call. Um, so I'm interested in hearing how you all are situated uh, disciplinarily, institutionally, kinds of work that you're engaged in and what sorts of intersections exist um, across all of our, our different pursuits uh, toward linguistic justice. So um, thanks again. Uh, um, my name is Bryce Nordquist. I'm a professor here of writing and rhetoric at Syracuse. And I'm also uh, the Dean's Professor of Community Engagement uh, for the College of Arts and Sciences at Syracuse University. Uh, and from that position, I coordinate um, a center for public publicly engaged scholarship uh, in the humanities and arts, um, and also for programming and uh, creative work, uh, primarily place-based. Place so um, this, uh, I, I'm an ethnographer, uh, a literacy ethnographer by training and by practice. Um, and my research uh, over the past several years has been more participatory and action-based in its orientation. Uh, so, so maybe there are intersections there. I'm, I'm saying all of this up front so that if you're thinking about, um, yeah, possible intersections uh, between uh, sort of linguistic justice, uh, le uh, philosophy of language, um, uh, community-based work or place-based work, uh, scholarship and action, uh, things like that, then uh, those are the kinds of things that I'm invested in. Um, so I want uh, just in this talk, briefly to introduce uh, key elements of a mobility's orientation to language and literacy studies, uh, and then to consider how this orientation might help us extend pursuits of linguistic justice across fields and institutions. Um, so first, uh, why focus on mobilities in language and literacy studies? Um, so I'm gonna begin with a video cut from a go along observation and interviews I've been conducting uh, with multilingual students, first-generation immigrants uh, in the U.S. Uh, on their daily subway commutes to and from school in downtown Manhattan, New York City. Uh, the students I've been traveling with are drawn into these commutes, uh, some as long as five hours round trip across the city, uh, by promises of acceleration and accumulation through Syracuse University's dual enrollment program. Uh, this is a program that partners with teachers and administrators at high schools, so secondary schools across the US and many in New York State um, to offer a range of courses, standardized courses that travel across this kind of network of schools uh, that students can gain college credit from. So I don't know if there's something, I mean, I know uh, um, different national contexts have obviously like, dip, you know, uh, radically different systems, but in the US it is a current trend for secondary students by the millions to gain college credit uh, in their secondary school and then transfer that credit to four, two or four year university, college or university, um, so that they come into the university with like statuses as you know, third year students in many cases, or certainly second year students in many cases. And it's a kind of rush for accumulation um, that is happening in educational systems in the United States. Um, this is not so central to this talk, but it is um, part of this larger project that I'm doing. Uh, but for our purposes, I'm interested in these kinds of, um, the ways that these go along uh, sessions um, uh, sort of illuminate different aspects of uh, relations between language, literacy, and mobilities, and, and then to sort of have us think together about how a mobilities paradigm can help us think about attending to language use, language practices, uh, and literacy practices for my point. Um, so, so maybe the next slide, and then I'll talk through it as it runs uh, 
So we can go ahead and just, uh, rather than including the audio and captioning in this segment, I'm just gonna talk over it, as I said before, for the sake of time, and I'll provide a description for accessibility. So this is Charles, he starts his com commute at New Lots, uh, uh, the last stop on the three train into Brooklyn. Uh, he arrives at the station after about a 20 minute walk. He starts a typical homework routine, discussion board responses saved offline and then transferred to Google Classroom uh, at stations with Wi-Fi. Charles meets up with Annie, who you see here, some uh, waits for cell reception to coordinate meetups. Uh, Annie and Charles arrange their work around each other, other passengers, seating and standing options, handholds, jostles, brake screeches, and time between stops. They share paper copies of an article, discuss extracurricular and social events while composing on their phones, and talk through their college application processes and mismatches between college dreams and financial circumstances. Messages, talking, writing, reading, playing music, and games become an amalgam of shared practice every morning. As soon as they're off the train, they catch up on missed messages uh, because they can again access Wi-Fi and cell data. We emerge here on the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge. And he says that our session has made her much earlier than usual, which we all joke is actually on time. And we walk to school through Police Plaza. Uh, more than once, Charles has remarked that it's the safest place in the city for me and the most dangerous place for him. Um, so so uh, we're going to return to this video in a second to unpack other elements of it. But um, just that's a perfect uh, brief overview. So thanks, uh, Carla, for playing that. Uh, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, a number of language and literacy uh, scholars in language and literacy studies ask us to pay special uh, attention to spatial, material, affective dimensions of language and literacy practices like the ones represented in this video. These approaches teach us that languages and literacies are emergent, embodied, layered, and distributed across space and time. Consequently, they emphasize entanglements of language, uh, literacy, and mobility. As Kevin Leander and Gail Bolt, Alistair Pennycook assert, uh, these orientations shift literacy and language from a problem of representation to a problem of space, time, and movement. Following these calls, I study and write about the ways in which movements across languages, modes, spatial and cultural borders, scales of time, digital networks, school buildings, and systems of education depend upon language and literacy repertoires, uh, just as the emergence and development of language and literacies depend upon intertwined spatial and temporal mobilities. Moreover, space and scale, places and scales are constituted, so tied together and separated by the trajectories of people, objects, ideas, and information moving through them. So that activity in place is always indexing and thus rearranging spatial and temporal orders. In light of this dynamism and simultaneity, tracing mobilities becomes key for attending to the complexities of linguistic and literate activity. And I believe that attending to complexity is the first and most important step in the pursuit of linguistic justice. But in the midst of all of this complexity, it can be very difficult to know where to begin tracing. Which movements do we follow? How do we decide? These questions are really only answerable in the context of specific projects. But for now, I think we can uh, today maybe productively ask together how different understandings of mobility suggest different paths, uh, methods of inquiry, and collective action in the pursuit of linguistic justice. Um, so uh, the next slide, uh, actually, maybe this is the slide I'm wanting to be on. So we could just camp here. Um, thanks. Um, more than a decade ago, sociologists uh, Mimi Scheller and John Uri identified a new mobilities paradigm emerging in the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, Scheller describes this paradigm as a focus on the interdependence of embodied and material practices of movement, digital and communicative mobilities, the infrastructures and systems of governance that enable and disable movement, um, and the representations, ideologies, and meanings attached to both movement and stillness. With contributions from diverse fields, work within this paradigm focuses on practices and representations of mobility to show how ways of moving are always imbricated in multiple mobilities and fixities and conceptualizations of these. This emphasis on interdependence among mobilities and immobilities across scales from the bodily to the global is the aspect of the paradigm uh, with the most potential for furthering the work of language and literacy studies. So writing studies uh, where I, 
most often situate my own work, um, explicitly engages mobilities in a num number of sometimes overlapping, sometimes diverging areas of research. I'm not, I'm not sure how these uh, sort of articulate across fields. Um, so uh, a short list of these include spatial studies of language and literacy, studies of tra transition and transfer or translation, uh, literacy networks, ecologies and activity systems, translingual and transnational literacies, studies of access and articulation, disability studies, digital and multimodal literacies. And so taken together, uh, these approaches provide robust accounts of relations between languages, literacies, and mobilities. Uh, however, they are seldom taken together, and I'm, I'm assuming that is true across subfields and in all disciplines. Uh, while these areas help us understand singular mobilities or interlocking mobilities with re within related spheres of activity, our robust and evolving understandings of language and literacy are seldom accompanied by multidimensional and multiscalar concepts or conceptions of mobility. Uh, so maybe the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, this is good. This is where I think a mobilities framework can help in language and literacy studies uh, as it attends to material, representational and embodied movements of people, texts, objects, ideas, and information across scales. Literacies and languages are always mobile. They depend upon spatial and temporal mobilities for meaning and for survival. As Ming Zhang Lu and Bruce Horner explain, literacies and languages are constantly in movement and rebirth through the labor of those recontextualizing them. A mobilities orientation helps us attend to this labor of recontextualization by reminding us that all literacies are intertwined with mobilities um, and that all mobilities have material, representational, and embodied dimensions. These are the constellations that I'm referring to in this first bullet point, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit further in the next slide. Um, I also believe this framework can help us resist bounded and static notions of space and time that still predominate in official representations of language, literacy, and education. Um, likewise, this orientation helps us challenge assumptions of scales as pre-existing containers or spheres of activity. A mobilities approach focuses attention on the physical and representational mobilities of people and things that constitute scales. In other words, on processes and projects of scale making. And finally, for this presentation at least, this framework helps us attend to the frictions and systems uh, that enable and disable movements of people, languages, messages, and ideas that privilege some movements and languages at the expense of others. Uh, of course, this isn't a comprehensive list, and um, you know there are many other key concepts. I'm sure you all have other concepts and concerns in mind, um, but for the sake of time, I'm, I'll try to tease out the possibilities uh, for these these four concepts. So, uh, so constellated mobilities, I think, should be the next slide. Um, thanks. Uh, Situated uh, within the humanities more broadly, uh, rhetoric and writing studies in the US context is still predominantly a text-centered field. Um, I'm interested to hear uh, how you all are approaching language and through what kinds of data, but uh, uh, our field is still uh, within a humanities tradition, still primarily text-centered. Uh, consequently, we tend to rely on discursive representations of mobility uh, and seldom show how movements of languages and literacies depend upon material and embodied mobilities. In other words, our studies of language and literacy are often don't attend to seemingly mundane movements and stoppages of bodies, along with the systems that enable or disable their movements. Um, this is like movements of bodies across city, as you've seen here with Charles and districts, institutions and campuses, techno and media spaces, um, through hallways on highways, subways, and so on. Uh, but as geographer Tim Cresswell asserts, mobility always involves the entanglement of material movements, representations, and embodied experiences of movement. He writes that to understand mobility without recourse to representation on the one hand or the material corporality on the other is to miss the point. Ultimately, holistic understandings of mobility require attention to all three aspects. In the first sense, material movement refers to the mobilities of people, objects, and ideas that can be measured and mapped. For instance, we can map Charles's daily commute and calculate the time it takes him to get from his neighborhood to school and back. When compared to the commutes of other students, this map might tell us something about who moves the furthest, the fastest, or most often, all politically significant questions. 
but measurements don't address the meanings Charles attaches to his daily train rides, nor do they convey how he experiences these physically and emotionally. In the second sense, representations of mobility abound. Mobility is figured as a threat, a privilege, a right, a condition of modernity, the goal of education, and so on. Charles's daily journey to school is tied up with meanings attached to college access and economic mobility. His family's migration from Guyana in pursuit of the American dream, the situation of his school in Police Plaza, and the implications of this for his Black body. And these meanings are embedded in layers of individual and collective histories of colonialism, segregation, incarceration, and also of hope and perseverance. Finally, there is the embodied sense of mobile practice. This involves the exhaustion Charles feels as he boards the train in the early morning, the concentration and uncertainty of composing responses for class, the coordination of reading and writing and languaging while tethered to a pole, and the interruption that sidetracks or spurs an idea. Holistic understandings of language and literacy require attention to constellations of mobility. Uh, so the next slide is uh, place. Um, in what he terms a logic of inversion, anthropologist Tim Ingold identifies a rationale central to the structure of modern thought. That is the impulse to turn the pathways along which life is lived into the boundaries in, within which life is contained. Through this inversion, movement is figured as a series of trips between fixed points, as paths are transformed into dotted lines, divided into stages, and then rolled and packed into the confines of a destination. The lines linking these destinations, link, like those of an air or rail traffic map, are not traces of movement, but point-to-point -point connectors. Our models of education perform and depend upon such inversions. Routes connecting fixed points of departure to fixed points of arrival constitute a grid used to individuate and measure the efficacy and efficiency of students' movements. The demands of the job market must be met in college courses, which must meet the demands of more advanced courses, while the demands of college determine the objectives of high school and so on down the line. Like points on a map, these stages represent clustered locations of apparently self-evident social relations, ideologies, languages, genres, and practices. In opposition to this logic of inversion, Ingold proposes that places are produced, and thus we are emplaced through movements. These movements through, around, to, and between places create what he describes as a meshwork in which the intersecting paths along which life uh, is lived are knotted together at particular junctures to constitute places. The more paths or lifelines that intersect, the greater the density of the knot. A classroom, for example, is a place where the lines of students, teachers, information, and materials are tightly knotted together but these lines are no more contained within a room than are threads contained within a knot. Rather, they trail beyond it, only to become caught up with other lines in other places. In this way, practices in our classrooms are not place bound, but are rather place binding. Places are created and tied together by threads of movement. Our, our entire lives unfold along these threads. Uh, the next slide is uh, scale making. Um, thanks. Um, so, because we tend to operate from vertical rather than lateral conceptions of place, time, and movement, considerations of mobility and literacy and language studies tend to scale quickly up to the global, as paying attention to mobilities becomes a way of countering the limits of the local. As Kate Vieira suggests, the global can be figured as literacy's ability to move and link people to macro social structures. Vieira demonstrates this movement brilliantly in her own ethnographic work, showing how the material circulation of papers, visas, green cards, passports, enables and blocks the movements of documented and undocumented immigrants into and through American bureaucratic systems and material spaces. But her work also shows how literacies don't just connect people to global scales, they also continuously make and remake these scales. She shows how scales are spatial and temporal orders created as people and papers move. As geographer Andrew Harrod suggests, the question is not how scale orders social processes, but rather how social actors create geographic scales through their activities and through language. In this way, a mobilities frame pushes us to attend to processes and projects of scale making, 
By scale making, I mean the constellated mobilities of people, ideas, objects, and information that bring spatialities and temporalities into relation with each other. Rather than thinking of scales as a set of concentric circles from local to global, we can imagine Ingold's meshwork of interconnected knots or earthworm tunnels in the case of the image on this slide. Um, scale making ties some places and times together and separates others through rhythms of movement. And so movements lead to contested and tentative formations of places and scales. So the, I think the last concept that we want to talk about is friction. Anthropologist Anna Singh uses the term friction to describe the awkward, unequal, unstable, and creative qualities of interconnection across differences that enable and disable movement. Friction accompanies mobilities of people, objects, texts, languages, and capital along scales and across space and time. There is no mobility without friction. Singh explains, as a metaphorical image, friction reminds us that heterogeneous and unequal encounters can lead to new arrangements of culture and power. If literacies and languages depend upon spatial and temporal mobilities, then friction is an essential component of the emergence and transformation of literacies and languages through practice. This compels us to attend not only to the literate and linguistic mobilities represented in text and speech and the frictions they encounter when they run up against perceptions and expectations of language and literacy standards, but also to the material and embodied mobilities across spaces and times and the frictions that provoke and redirect these. So um, this brings us back in the final slide to Charles's commute, or maybe penultimate. Are we back to the video or we have another one here? Oh no, don't worry about this. Yeah, good, thanks. Um, a rereading of this commute in light of a mobilities frame that includes attention to constellated mobilities practices of place and scale making and the frictions that propel and slow and halt these practices. So almost immediately, Charles's train passes African burial ground station. I know this because he wrote about the site in an assignment he shared uh, before our sessions began. So in the essay, he writes about his connection to the square through his Afro-Guyanese ancestry. He writes about how the city still has more than 70 streets named after proprietors of slaves. He says, when you travel down the avenues of the individuals who oppress you, you can feel profoundly denied. I wonder how these feelings of oppression and denial map onto his daily walk through police plaza, where uh, we, here we have frictions of colonization and police brutality, connecting remembrances of transnational mobilities to concerns about everyday transportation and spatial relations of mobility and immobility. In terms of embodiment, I notice how Charles's practice emerges from the continuously reconstituted places of the train car and the imperatives of a classroom. A momentary position of stability provides an opportunity to complete a sentence while an awkward hold and a bumpy ride shake the article pages he's trying to read. In terms of scale making, a system of education is traced out in part by itineraries like Charles's across neighborhoods, schools, hallways, and classrooms. As Jen Nespor suggests, itineraries define an educational structure stretching out in space and time. Moreover, the work Charles saves at each stop is eventually assessed, quantified, aggregated, and circulated on transcripts and data reports. The circulation also defines educational structures and promises to save Charles time and money in the future through a, co a conversion to college credit, though many schools will block or reduce uh, this return on investment. Of course, there are many knots to untangle here, but I hope uh, kind of a brief attention to the mobilities of Charles's commute shows how all literacies uh, and language practices involve physical representational uh, practices and aspects of mobility, and that all forms of literacy and mobility are political. That is, they shape and are shaped by relations of power. If we're going to approach literacies as ways of being in the world, uh, we must attend to constellations and politics of mobility. Um, I believe that actively cultivating the mobilities orientation represented um, uh, um, here uh, can help us um, uh, uh, imagine new ways uh, 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 to organize programs and uh, transformative uh, means of learning uh, and of collective action. Um, I also believe that uh, it, this kind of project is central to equity-oriented 
and humanist research in education as it disrupts normative definitions of learning that rely on a logic of inversion and thus simple and static categorizations of individuals, communities, languages, disciplines, and stages of education, and so on. Uh, so uh, with these kinds of um, orientation, uh, relationships between literacy, mobility, and language in mind, um, I have just the final slide asked a couple of questions of you all, and maybe we can just sort of have conversations uh, around these uh, these and other questions, anything that you might be interested in. Um, so how might foregrounding patterns and representations, uh, practices of movement, um, reorient our attention to and alter our perceptions of language? Maybe that you're maybe they're already doing this in your own practice. Um, how can we design research projects, methods, and uh, interventions to more effectively tend to fleeting, distributed, multiple and complex sensory, emotional, and spatial dimensions of language practices? Um, and how can a if how can a mobility's orientation help amplify and extend uh, the social justice oriented pursuit of the LJS. Um, uh, so these are those, uh, these are some thoughts. Maybe we can just sort of go from here into any kind of questions or concerns. I realize this may be very different um, to your own kind of research agenda, or it may be very similar. <laughs> I don't know who's, uh, who's, who's represented here. So oh, I certainly won't assume where you're coming from and, and um, what kinds of connections can be drawn. But I do hope there are some connections uh, to be drawn. So thanks for listening.